nice of you. Um, so today, um, the talk will be divided in two parts. I'm going to present a bit LeakyX, what we do, and then I'm going to go into a bit of technical details about what we index. So um, we are an internet leak exchange platform, and we are also a reporting platform. So we index things uh, by crawling the internet, and we also offer the possibility for researchers to report those things to various companies or entities that might be affected. So who are we? Um, I'm Grégory Baudin, uh, come founder of uh, LeakyX. Uh, my background is mainly developer, DevOps, and sysadmin. Uh, the thing is, uh, by being in those positions, um, I was confronted with security all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, I quickly became uh, really passionate about it, and I decided to focus my career on that after that. I worked um, as a DevOps um, a system engineer at Google and DevOps at European Commission. And yeah, nowadays I'm just doing security research for LeakyX, developing new plugins, and uh, deploying uh, uh, new ways to index things. Uh, Danny Williams uh, is also a co-founder of LeakyX. He's um, currently doing some free software engineering with us, and he's also a PhD candidate in cryptography uh, at Polytechnic Paris. Um, the other people I need to mention are, or because they are really important, are our voluntary researcher. Um, so those are researchers that we assess individually and uh, we, to whom we give access to the most sensitive data. All right. So I wanted to start the talk a bit with this image, um, because uh, the, the talk will be focused around that, uh, the idea of scope and uh, how we handle it. Nowadays, uh, there are a lot of uh, bug bounty platforms, as you know. And if you guys are reporting, you know the, the hassle of being out of scope and this kind of thing. I think this image represents quite well what we want to mean by that. So um, those platforms, uh, the bug bounty platform, they, they have changed the information security landscape quite a bit. Uh, it's really nice because you can get money by just investing the com uh, investigating the companies and reporting security issue. Uh, as LeakX, we found that yeah, it can be a problem because the security leaks uh, on internet, most of the time, they are coming from the company that don't invest money in it. And that doesn't mean they are less, um, they are less critical, quite the opposite. So, yeah. At the moment, we have more than 29 million security uh, issue index on our platform, and most of them are out of scope or critical, but still need to be fixed. Um, yeah. So as I said, we try to provide a reporting platform as well, um, in parallel of our index. It's oriented to our responsible disclosure. Um, so we have, uh, we try to contact the company and uh, follow up on the communication, as I will show after. Um, we do have a quite a global offensive security uh, standpoint, because we are scanning offensively. And um, we do like the threat actors are doing, basically. We try to get there before them. So that's the first goal, uh, get there before the threat actors. Uh, we monitor all the current critical CVs and uh, the also software misconfiguration. We try to provide responsible alerts to those people, but um, with everything is we, we scan every day. Uh, we also try to automate those alerts and send, send them to both hosting providers, but also national cert. So every day there's, there's a mail that's going out with everything critical that we found and they have uh, the opportunity to, to act on it. So we know some uh, hosting provider are forwarding the abuse request to their customer, and they can fix the problem right away. So it, sometimes it takes less than 24 hours. We also mean to keep track of the incidents, because sometimes something happens on the internet, a leak goes out, and you don't know where it's from. Um, it has happened in the past where, well, we had a reply to that. We, we were looking on, in our index, and we saw, yeah, there was an open database for that particular company, so that's where it came from. We would like to reward the responsible researcher for autoscope issue. That's not the case at the moment. We would really love it, but we like the sponsor. Um, just because it's hard to keep them engaged, because uh, the problem with autoscope is at the moment they, are, they don't have any reward for it. Nobody wants to pay them. So um, this is how we work. Uh, we have probe that can the, the internet 24/7. Um, uh, 
they are storing uh, all the security issue in a database. And this database is accessible to our researchers. Uh, the researchers then just look at all the vulnerabilities that we found. And what they do is they try to identify the company or the entity responsible for the leak. Once this is done, uh, they are creating a report. In the report, they are adding the contact and we switch uh, the vulnerability to private. After that, um, it's up to various security companies to try to reconcile them and yeah, fix the issue. So this is what our interface look like. Um, in this case, we are seeing an exchange server. We are indexing the version and we are uh, saying, okay, it's vulnerable to this CPE. Uh, the researcher always have a create report button, which they can click. Um, it will basically uh, present them with this page. Um, it prepares everything for them. So the title is prepared, the description is prepared, and also all the technical details for the, for the vulnerability. The only thing they need to do really is find the contact information for them. And once they do that, we have a full process automated. Uh, we send uh, the email to the affected parties and we monitor the response. And uh, we also have a private email address that is shared across everyone. So everyone can stay in touch uh, through the same email address. So some numbers. Uh, we're scanning uh, yeah, 200, uh, and 50, 100, uh, and 50,000 ports per second, 24/7. Uh, we also we are also scanning domains because uh, we don't think scanning scanning IPs is enough. Um, if you have a VOS, you need to scan it as well. At this point in the index, we identify uh, 500 million more or less uh, services, and the same thing for the domain names. Uh, as I said earlier, we have 29 million leaks. One million of them are really critical. So Exchange Server, Palo Alto RC, Log4G, Elasticsearch DB, and so on. We, are, we have uh, 5 million API requests uh, per month on our, uh, on, our, on our site. And we send uh, 24 automatic reports to CERT and hosting company. Uh, worth to mention as well, uh, last year, our researcher, so the voluntary researcher, they have sent one for the report, so it's more than three per day. So they identify people and they try to notify them. We have 46 different plugins at the moment, and we also have two, two to five years of it. All right, so that was the number part and the presentation part. And now I'm going to speak a bit about the plugins, so what we scan. Um, it will be divided in a few categories. So what we classify as low information disclosure. So a small bit of information like OS of operating system or software information, internet network range. Uh, what we classify as I, uh, sometimes is uh, source code disclosure. So something that might not contain credential, but still give a clue uh, to the attacker about what he's facing. The critical one, so we are talking about exposure of credential, user access, or sensitive documents. And then we have the uh, high critical ACL misconfiguration. So those are database engines, but something we scan for as well at the moment are the queue software. So um, something we, we, we noticed is Kafka, for instance. There are a lot of open servers on the internet. So if you connect to the Kafka server, you can basically get all the data from it. We are also going to look at remote code execution, which, which is of course critical. And usually those happen through you now software vulnerabilities. And we will end up with IoT devices. So on low severity, we have something that I guess most, most of you know quite well, uh, the, the Apache statue page. Um, there are 600,000 currently that we index on the internet. It can be, it can reveal quite a lot. So if we look at this page, you can, for instance, know the internal network range. In this case, we know the reverse proxy front-end local address. But you also have the back-end uh, server resource information. So you know how much CPU it's using, how much bandwidth it's using. This can be useful if the attacker wants to, to do a denial of service on the target. He can just monitor what's happening, look at the CPU usage, and you know which request hits the harder. So it gives him a good indication. 
Um, in this page as well, you can find other things. Uh, of course, the client. All right. <laughs> So um, you also find the list of client IPs, uh, of course. Uh, you will see the internal network IPs. You will see other domain names that are hosted on the server. But you also see the URLs that people are visiting. Sometimes it can be a problem. For instance, if you have a private URL that is not password protected, people can find out about it. So, and you, yeah. All right. So the next thing I'm going to talk about, uh, the exposed Git directory. So usually, um, the web server is supposed to hide those files which are supposed to be hidden. So starting with a dot. But we are noticing that nowadays, um, for whatever reason, it's not always the truth anymore and more and more. We are suspecting it's because of Docker image configuration uh, in some, some application deployment. There are 100 and, yeah, there, are, there is 1 million of them uh, on index at the moment, a million and a half. Uh, this is a problem because, well, you don't need, people think you need to have a directory listing enabled to download everything about this. But if you have a git dumper, which is a tool by uh, Internet Watch, you can just download the full uh, git directory and object without having directory listing. So the problem, <laughs> so the problem is that is it allows you to download all the commits. Uh, if you download all the commits, you have access to the whole code history, as you will see, for instance, here. So we download every commit, every object uh, from the Git directory. And then if we use Git extractor, we can extract every commit you ever done on this Git repository. So it means if you made a commit to remove credentials, we will see that commit if you if you don't uh, delete it properly. So, for instance, here you can see the source of a PHP application, which is really secure. Um, I, whatever. <laughs> so, it, obviously, it can give an attacker a lot of resources and information on how you are handling your website and uh, let you in. <clears throat> so, this is not only true for uh, Git. Another way to get application sources. Uh, can be Docker registries. So Docker, reg Docker registries, most of them are supposed to be either the public Docker registry, so up.docker.com, but you can also have private Docker registries. So those are registries that people deploy for their own infrastructure. In this case, we are scanning for them as well, and we are trying to keep a list, a list of images that we find in those private registries, which are exposed without any password. In this case, uh, for instance, you can see that we found 52 images in the Docker registry. Uh, most of them are ending up with a dash dev, a dash prod. You can pretty much be sure that there are environment specific uh, details in those images. Maybe credentials, uh, at least you can grab the source code. All right. Another thing that we started scanning for recently as well is CheckMK. Uh, found totally by accident, but yeah, when we found it, we were like, this is huge as well. Uh, CheckMK is a monitoring agent. Um, so you deploy it on your server, and then you have a global server making queries to know, well, what's the status of your server. The problem with it is, is, is it's quite verbose. It doesn't have authentication. So if you leave it open to the internet, it will start giving a lot of information about your server. You just have to tell that to the server. And in this case, you can see system information, running process, firewall rules, uh, private public IP interface. Um, if some, there are multiple plugins for that agent as well. So if you have installed, for instance, the Docker plugin, you will see the list of Docker images that are running. And you could see their environment variables that you configure, which might contain credentials as well. And we'll speak about that here. So it gets scarier. Um, Environment variables, nowadays, they are used to configure containers most of the time. You shouldn't do that. You should try to use a vault or something like this. But people use, use them quite a lot to configure their application. So if we look into it, uh, we have two, two cases. The first thing that we saw is leaks to the .env file. This is mostly from the Laravel framework. framework. Uh, it tends to be fixed nowadays, but we still find a lot of them. 
Um, so you can find things like payment gateway credentials. You can find remote database credentials. This is a DC an AWS database, so it's remote. You can connect to it. Uh, you can find the S3 bucket credentials just by opening this URL in your browser. And there are, yeah, more than, yeah, 800,000 of them. This is also true uh, for, uh, that's what I was speaking earlier. This is also so true for a PHP info file. So if you expose a PHP info file, yeah, uh, usually it's not that big of a deal because you will have the PHP version. You will have uh, the extension that are loaded. Okay, fair enough. The problem, as I was saying, is people usually now uh, use containers and they use environment variables to store uh, their credentials. So if you have the PHP info page, you are basically accessing also the, those environment variables. And here you can see, uh, you, you can have the, the, the remote uh, database again. You can have, uh, yeah, pretty much everything, all the credentials. This is another example. Uh, you have the encryption key for the session or a forum. You have the SMTP credentials. You have the Redis uh, server address with the password, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So um, the last class here will be ACL misconfiguration. So we have more or less 100,000 database uh, with more than 1,000 uh, records because that's something we index as well. When we find an open database, we try to look at how many records it has in it. So we do a count, basically. And we have 100,000 of them. So... Um, we also look at the volume of data that is present. And every day, we index pretty much, uh, we see that there is a pretty much 12 terabytes of volume that we index. Uh, sometimes we find a database that is more than a 100 terabytes uh, because Elasticsearch. Uh, so Elasticsearch is one of the most exposed databases. Um, there is a tool that we made because sometimes Elasticsearch is not open, but you have a Kibana uh, interface. Uh, something that, that is to know is Kibana is basically acting like a proxy for Elasticsearch. So um, you can basically just use, if even if Elasticsearch is not open, but your Kibana is open, people can use uh, Kibana as a proxy to, uh, well, to, to query the Elasticsearch server behind. Uh, that's what the tool we brought do here. And, uh, yeah. So you can basically dump everything here. It's just, uh, it, it's a simple database, but you can see you can get the date of birth of people, um, yeah, their name, their uh, ID number, et cetera, et cetera. All right. This is also true for uh, MySQL database. Um, some of them are open with, uh, they just have user root. You don't have to specify a password. Some of them have a password uh, root, as a password root, which is really secure as well. And yeah, you, you can find, you can find everything in those tables. Uh, that's something we do, by the way. Uh, we get the schema of all the database, so you can search on our, on our search engine as well. Uh, that allows the researcher to get a bit more information on the database without having to connect to it. Uh, you can also, yeah, maybe find out who it belongs to, and you can also use the search to, to query those. All right. It also happens with a Mongo database. Um, maybe you can see the name of the first database in this uh, Mongo server, which is read me to recover your data. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Uh, we are going to talk about this. So... Those open servers, um, obviously, nowadays, uh, threat actors are scanning the internet and uh, they are trying to find them as well. So um, what we do is uh, when we see that the database has been infected by a threat actor, uh, we try to get uh, the ransomware message that they left as well. So we can see here the, there is a 12K database that we found that had a ransomware message which is, uh, yeah, 10% of all the database we indexed. Um, in here, we usually see two ways. Um, the ransomware group just leave a message and say, yeah, pay uh, this amount of Bitcoin uh, to this address in 48 hours, or your database will be 
we, you will never get your database back. And we have a second type of message, which basically gives an onion URL, uh, and you have, a you have a token to use. And with this, this token, you can try to negotiate to get your database back as well. Um, obviously, we don't know if they keep their words. I would not believe they do, especially the one that just dropped a BTC address. So uh, the next vulnerability we try to index is uh, remote code execution. We have 200k uh, results in there. Um, they are usually big IP exchange. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, a PHP vulnerability as well and uh, other firewalls uh, that have remote code execution. So uh, this one is interesting because it's you want to know it in uh, 27. And it's still found quite a lot. Um, PHP unit, for those that don't know, is a testing framework for PHP. So uh, it means you install it uh, with your package manager, and you can basically test your code with it. The problem is you are not supposed to deploy uh, that tool to your production server. The other problem is, yeah, most people do. So what happens is uh, when this tool is deployed, um, it leaves a, uh, it leaves a file that is called evalstdin.php. And the only thing you have to do is send a post request with the PHP code you want to execute. And yeah, you can see why that would be a problem. <laughs> and that's still the case for a lot of servers. Another thing that uh, is quite exploited nowadays is uh, Confluence as well. So that's something that we index too. Uh, there are a few exploits now that are available uh, just to, to to have a shell there. Uh, we found quite a lot. There, there are a lot of servers still open. Uh, we wanted to do a big shout out uh, to Big IP because um, that's the craziest vulnerability I've seen in a while. Calling a bash endpoint and giving a command to get root is uh, it, 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 it's really awesome. So um, we index that. We also index Bitbucket. We started to index uh, Zimbra, Zixel, uh, for TOS uh, because of the last vulnerability that ran out. And uh, yeah, that's it. The last thing I wanted to talk about uh, is more of an investigation that we did um, for IoT devices. Um, this concerns iSilicon DVR. Uh, so iSilicon basically is a platform for uh, DVR devices um, made by uh, one uh, manufacturer. Uh, the problem is that is the manufacturer gives uh, the chipset, everything, uh, gives a base uh, firmware uh, to all the vendors. And then usually what happens is uh, the vendors don't care about it anymore. So uh, in all those firmware, uh, they have pretty much the same password as root. Uh, there was a research that was done, that was done in 2017 with a guy that found, uh, well, the, the password and cracked it. So uh, there is still a lot of uh, device uh, vulnerable out there. The thing is, um, we did a bit more research because we found that they were also vulnerable to HTTP traversal. And uh, we found another hash. So, um, yeah, this hash basically uh, is not the same that the, f the one that was in the first research, but we decided to look for it. And what we found is, yeah, uh, cracking communities are looking for it since, uh, yeah, 2015. So the, for the first post in a forum, um, basically there are forums where people send their hash to crack, was in 2015. Uh, other, there are other devices because uh, the software that is actually causing trouble is uh, UCHTPD. There are a lot of embedded devices that are still uh, vulnerable to this vulnerability as well. So uh, usually we check for it as well and we just try to get the host file uh, to get a bit of information on the device. And that's it uh, for the talk. Um, one thing that I will, that, that I will say is uh, we are starting to get a few researchers, so voluntary researcher. If you guys would like to contribute, etc., um, I would encourage you to join the site and maybe create one or two reports every week because it will help everyone. Um, not everyone has access to all the plugins, so uh, the remote code execution plugins, for instance, is private. 
but once we did a background check, we can basically give you access to, to those plugins and, uh, yeah, let you report them as well. That's it. Thank you very much. That's great. Is there any questions? Don't be shy. I know it's early morning, but no questions. Ah, this question is back very far away. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one question. Do you have statistics about the success rate of your reports to thirds and organizations? The access rate of the reports? The success. The ah, success rate. Uh, that's something that we try to do. Uh, sadly, uh, we, we still have to, to, to improve it. Um, what we see is, uh, usually it's a manual process. A lot of people are just not replying to the reports, but we see that people are fixing it, yes. Um, I would say it's a 50%. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Hello. Thank you for the presentation and the, for the services that you are providing. I have a question. What is the business model actually of uh, Likix? How do you so, finance yourself? Uh, at the moment, uh, what we do is uh, try to provide the data to, to some security companies need those data as well. So that's what we do. We try to provide it to them. Uh, they are usually using it for their own customer. Uh, recently, we, we just deployed uh, a Stripe uh, integration as well uh, to let enterprise just uh, create uh, their account and access a bit more data. Uh, but that's it. Yeah. We, 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 something that I wanted when I created LeakyX is first getting sponsor uh, to pay the researchers. Uh, that's something that's really difficult uh, to find at the moment. But I still hope that we'll get there. Thank you. One more last questions. Ah, here. Yeah. <laughs> I think some, someone designed it. Ex uh, so thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question was about the technical side of it, because you talk about plugins, but what is the engine that runs? Uh, it's uh, it's a completely custom. So we did, I'm a huge uh, Golang fan. So I did everything in Golang. There is an open source version on uh, GitHub, which is called N9 Explorer. Uh, but yeah, everything is custom. Um, the, the only the only uh, open source tool that we use at the moment for the scanning is Mascan for the for the port, and that's all. But after that, grabbing the banner, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is totally custom. So you don't you don't reuse uh, nuclei templates or stuff like this. Or Sorry, you don't reuse nuclei templates. No, no, we did in the past. We tried to create an engine for our own tool, but yeah, um, I don't think there is a need for that because they are they, they also have their uh, search engine nowadays. So it will be a bit overlapping. Uh, we try to make the plugin to make plugins that cannot be done in nuclei most of the time. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if we if we find something interesting. Uh, Sometimes a nuclear template would be interesting. We just code it in Golang. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.